Hello, and welcome to this Gresham College lecture on the Broken Cosmic Distance Ladder. My name is Roberto Trotta. I'm a visiting professor of cosmology at Gresham College and a professor of astrostatistics at Imperial College London, currently on leave of absence and visiting the International School for Advanced Studies in Trieste, Italy, from where I'm giving this lecture today. We're going to talk about how to measure distances in the universe, which is a surprisingly hard problem. In fact, if we look uh, to the moon in the sky, sometimes it appears so close as if it feels as if almost we could just touch it and reach out to it and pluck it out of the sky. Um, it appears so close to us, we can make out all sorts of things on its face when it's fully illuminated. Some people see a rabbit on the face of the moon. Some cultures see a toad, a lady, a man with a bundle on his back, even a man's face, which I never quite could understand uh, and could never quite make out. So how far is the moon and how can we tell, especially in antiquity when technology and science were not quite so advanced as they are today and determining distances to the objects in the sky was always a big challenge. And in fact, you know, while the moon seems tantalizingly close, sometimes the stars, on the other hand, appear always to be forever out of reach, aloof and distant and forever unreachable. In fact, so unreachable and so aloof that W.H. Auden, in his poem, The More Loving One, described them thus. How should we like it where stars to burn with a passion for us we could not return? If equal affection cannot be, let the more loving one be me. Admirer, as I think I am, of stars that do not give a damn, I cannot, now I see them, say, I have missed one terribly all day. So stars are distant. Stars are uh, really out of reach of us, except when perhaps we see a shooting star, uh, which of course is not a star at all. It's just a little piece of rock a meteorite burning up in the atmosphere, which however does give us the illusion that stars have for a fleetingly short moment come to within a reach. So how far away is the moon and the sun and the thousands of stars that bejewel the night? And what about nebulae, those fuzzy glowing patches of light that only the big telescopes of the 20th century could reveal with some clarity? How far are they? Are they? And can our human eye combine with the powers of our imagination and of science and technology reach all the way to the far end of the universe and, and, and stretch a cosmic ruler to measure distances out in space? Can we build a cosmic distance ladder that rung after rung will take us all the way to the end of the visible universe? We will today explore all of those questions and see that mysteriously, the cosmic distance ladder that we've built over centuries and millennia appears today to be broken. Now, the earliest method to establish distances for faraway objects is one that remains very much useful today, and it is literally at your fingertips. So if you stretch your arm in front of you and put up your index fingers like this, and you look at the finger by closing one eye and then the other eye, you will see the position of the finger appear to jump with respect to a distant background. Now, my finger is moving here, but if you just close alternatively the left and right eye, the appearance of movement is, will, will be due to the different vantage point, about 10 or so centimeters apart from each one of your two eyes. And so this phenomenon is called parallax. Parallax coming from an, a, a, an old Greek word, which means a change. And if you move now your finger closer to the tip of your nose and you do the same experiment again by alternating the eye that you close, you will see that the parallax is now much increased. So the closer by the object, the bigger the apparent angle by which it jumps with respect to a distant background. And conversely, the farther away, the smaller the angle. So if conceivably we can measure the angle, the parallax angles of objects in the sky by looking at them from different vantage points, then we can in principle, hopefully measure the distance using simple trigonometry. 
So it is, it is a great tool to measure distances to objects that are relatively nearby, provided we have a background, a backdrop by which to judge their apparent change in position. Also, we can already predict that if objects are too far away, the parallax angle will be there, but it will be too small to be, to be measurable. So at some point, parallax will stop working. Now, the first person to use parallax to try and measure the distance to the sun and the moon was the ancient Greek astronomer and mathematician Hipparchus of Nicaea, which is in modern day Turkey. Hipparchus lived in the second century BC and is the inventor of trigonometry, is also considered the father of astronomy. By many, he's considered the greatest astronomer and observer in antiquity. He made many discoveries, which included the precession of the equinoxes, the fact that seasons are, are, are of an equal length. And he also perfected the method to predict uh, eclipses more accurately than it was possible before. He created the first astronomical catalog of stars measuring the brightness and position of about 850 stars in the sky. And when considering the, the, the question of how far away is the moon, Hipparchus used the fact that a total solar eclipse, uh, which is one in which, as we know, the Earth, the moon, and the sun are lined up like in this uh, diagram here. Uh, and he, the fact that the, the sun was completely covered by the moon, if uh, you were looking at the solar eclipse from his hometown, Nicaea, and so the line of sight to the rim of the sun was the red one in this diagram, while the, uh, the eclipse was partial as seen from the city of Alexandra in Egypt, which was uh, on the same meridian as Nicaea, but nine degrees further south. So by using this fact and the fact that the sun was sufficiently far away so as to not exhibit any noticeable parallax, he was able to estimate the angle between the red and the green line and with some mathematics, therefore establish the distance between the earth and the moon, uh, correctly attributing the difference in appearance of the solar eclipse to the parallax phenomenon as applied to the moon. He eventually arrived at the figure for the distance between the earth and the moon of 63 earth radii. radii. Now, in order to convert this distance, which was remarkably close to the right value, which is about 60 radii, in order to convert this value to an actual uh, distance, one needed to know what was the radius of the earth and therefore the circumference of the earth. Now, this had been done already 50 years earlier by Eratosthenes who uh, had heard from a traveler that on the summer equinox, the sun's rays at noon illuminated the bottom of a well in the city of Sain in modern day Egypt without casting any shadows. This meant that at that point in time, the sun was directly overhead that city. On the same day, he measured the length of a shadow cast by a stick in Alexandria. And therefore, by comparing the angle that the sun made in Alexandria and in Sain, he was able to find the difference in latitude between, between the two cities, which he estimated as being 1 50th of a full circle. Now, if you had the difference in latitude, all he needed to do was to measure the distance, the physical distance between the two cities. And so he hired professional surveyors who walked with equally spaced steps between the two cities, reporting a distance of 5,000 stadia. He concluded, therefore, that the circumference of our planet was 250,000 stadia, 50 times as much, which is a number that's a little difficult to translate in today's units because the stadium as a unit of measure was not uniform throughout antiquity. So if we put 10 stadia to the mile, then Eratosthenes estimates for the circumference of the Earth will be 25,000 miles, which puts the Earth radius, if we assume the Earth to be a perfect, perfect sphere, which it isn't, to 3,980 3, miles or 6,400 kilometers, which is very close to the actual value of 6,378 kilometers. Be as it might, given this estimate of the size of the Earth, it is clear that 63 Earth radii, Hipparchus's estimate for the distance of the Earth to the moon, did put the moon out of reach of even the tallest ladder on top of the tallest of mountains. This measurement established 
200 years before uh, BC, the first rung in our distance ladder, which today sits at about 384,000 kilometers. That's a mean distance between the Earth and the Moon. The actual distance varies as the orbit of the Moon is not a perfect circle. So this was our first rung. What about the next rung, the distance to the Sun? Eratosthenes tried, um, Hipparchus tried to measure distance of, to the Sun as well, but his method gave a hopelessly low estimate, much, much lower, lower than, than what it is. He estimated it 490 Earth radii, which is too small by a large factor. The actual distance Earth-Sun is about 23,400 times the Earth radius, or 150 million kilometers. So how could we then measure the, the distance to the Sun? Now, by the 17th century, uh, uh, the Co uh, Copernican and Keplerian revolution in terms of our understanding of the orbits and the structure of the solar system had been uh, completed and was in full swing. In particular, Kepler told us that uh, the orbits of uh, planets going around the sun are ellipses. And those ellipses, which are a kind of stretched circle, had several properties that are uh, encapsulated in Kepler's laws of planetary motion that Newton would a few decades later reinterpret and, and explain in terms of uh, gravity. In particular, Kepler's third law tells us that uh, the orbital period squared of a planet going around the sun divided by the semi-major axis of the ellipse, which is the long part of the ellipse uh, in blue in this diagram, so the orbital period squared divided by the semi-major axis cubed is a constant for all planets, indeed for all bodies orbiting another body. Uh, and that in turn, because we know the period of all the planets, at least all the planets that were known at, at Kepler's time, uh, that in turn gives us the uh, relative distances of the planets to the sun. So if we take the earth to define the standard of distance, the AU, the astronomical unit, and we say that the Earth-Sun average distance is one AU, then you see on the right that all of the other planets, where uh, thanks to Kepler's third law, can be put at relative distances from the Sun. Mercury, 0.39 AU, Venus, 0.72 AU, Mars, 1.5 AU, and so on and so forth. So Kepler's gave us a way of measuring relative distances of the planets to the Sun, and therefore to measure the relative size of the solar system, but we still didn't know what the AU was. How big was this astronomical unit in units of which all of the other distances of the solar system could be measured? And that's where Edmund Halley comes in. In 1716, the famous astronomer issued a, 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 really, a real call to arms to all the diligent searchers of, of the heavens to take advantage of a very rare astronomical phenomenon that would happen a, a, a few decades later in order to finally pinpoint down the AU, the astronomical unit. The phenomenon that Halley was interested in was a transit of Venus. Now, Venus is one of the inferior planets, one of the planets that orbit inside the orbit of the Earth. Uh, and as such, it goes around the sun faster than the Earth does. And uh, as it does so, the Earth and Venus line up several times in the course of their um, orbits around the Sun. However, because the orbit of Venus is tilted by three degrees with respect to the orbit of the Earth, as you see in this diagram, the only times when the Earth and Venus alignments lead to Venus actually being in front of the Sun, a so-called transit of Venus on the face of the Sun, is when the alignment between the Earth and Venus happens at the point of intersection of the two orbits, which is called a node. This is an extremely rare astronomical phenomenon with a cycle of 243 years. So what happens for an observer on the Earth is that this transits, Venus passing in front of the disk of the sun, happens twice uh, in, uh, in June, then nothing for 100 in, in the course of eight years, then nothing for 105 years, then another two transits eight years apart in December, and then nothing again for the next 121 years. After which the cycle recommences. 
No, Halley, writing in 1716, uh, predicted a pair of transits happening in 1761 and 1769. And he knew that by looking at Venus from different points, vantage points on the surface of the Earth, and looking at the transit of Venus on the face of the sun, let's say if you were able to look at Venus transiting the sun from a northerly location, such as, such as Canada, and then from a southerly location, such as Tahiti in the Pacific Ocean, your line of sight to the transit would be slightly different. And parallax would mean that the transiting planet on the face of the sun, which is shown by the green and dashed uh, red lines on the right-hand side, would cut a slightly different path. So by timing the, 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 the transit, from two widely different locations on the surface of the Earth, and using the phenomenon of parallax, one could measure the distance to Venus, and therefore the distance, and therefore the AU, effectively, because we know that Venus is so many AUs uh, in, in a, away from the Sun. So this was a, a great opportunity and a rare opportunity to see uh, a transit, and therefore all the uh, natural scientists of the time geared up to make that observation. In fact, this, would not, this would, was not the first time that anybody had seen the transit of Venus because the English astronomer Jeremiah Horrocks had been one of only two people in recorded history, together with his friend William Crabtree, to observe the transit of Venus, uh, the earlier transit of Venus in 1639 which Horrocks himself had predicted against Kepler's prediction of a near miss. In fact, there is even a memorial tablet that commemorates him inside Westminster, Westminster Abbey saying, having in so short a life detected the long inequality in the mean motion of Jupiter and Saturn, discovered the orbit of the moon to be an ellipse, determined the motion of the lunar apse, suggested the physical cause of its revolution and predicted from his own observations the transit of Venus, which was seen by himself and his friend, William Crabtree, on Sunday, the 24th of November in the old calendar, 1639. This tablet facing the monument of Newton was raised after the lapse of more than two centuries, December the 9th, 1874, a fitting memorial to a great astronomer whose life was tragically cut short at the young age of 22. In fact, when Horrocks saw the spectacle of the transit of Venus, he was so elated that he wrote in his diary this lyrical description. Thy return, posterity shall witness. Years must roll away, but then at length the splendid sight again shall greet our distant children's eyes. Sadly, Horrocks would not have any children who would witness the 1761 or 1769 um, eclipses, um, transits. Now, in, in 1761, over 120 missions in 62 countries were dispatched to observe it, the grandest international astronomical effort ever attempted. In fact, the Royal Astronomer, Neville Maskelyne, for example, sailed all the way to St. Helena, only to have his observations scuppered by clouds. So evidently Halley's good wishes, which he expressed in 1716, and I wish them luck and pray above all that they are not robbed of the hoped for spectacle by the untimely gloom of a cloudy sky. Well, Halley's wishes didn't work out for masculine. And in fact, despite the many measurements made, made during the 1761 uh, transit, the measurements were too variable. The quality wasn't sufficient to pin down the AU and the parallax angle in a reliable fashion. So a second chance would present itself in 1769. And this time, that chance could not be missed because no, no other chance would present itself for another century or more. So in England, the Royal Society mounted an ambitious scientific expedition. They convinced the Admiralty to buy an outfit at great cost, a sturdy merchant ship, which they renamed the Endeavour. And they gave, it, they gave its command to the ablest navigator and cartographer of, of uh, uh, His Majesty's uh, fleet, Lieutenant James Cook. They also petitioned the King, George III, to bankroll the mission with over a million pounds in today's money of his own money. And they equipped the Endeavour with the finest telescopes and the finest instruments, the finest clocks 
that money could buy at the time before sending it to the other side of the world, in the middle of, of the Pacific Ocean, to the island of Tahiti that had recently been conveniently discovered, quote unquote, because of course Tahiti had been inhabited for centuries already by, uh, uh, by uh, Tahitians coming presumably from other Polynesian islands, perhaps even from New Zealand, uh, had been discovered, like I said, for the king, in quote unquote, by Captain Wallace uh, two years previously. So when the transit occurred, the British expedition found itself ready. On June the 3rd, 1769, they were in Tahiti. They had built themselves a fort to be undisturbed by the locals during their observations, which they called Fort Tahiti, uh, Fort Venus on Tahiti, which you can see uh, uh, pictured here in this lithography by um, Sidney Parkinson, one of the artists on board of James Cook's first voyage. voyage. This time, Cook, um, Charles Green, who was the astronomer, the second astronomer, because Cook himself could counted as an astronomer on board, the, uh, the, the two astronomers found themselves in Tahiti in perfect conditions. And Cook wrote in his diary, the day proved as favorable to our purpose as we could wish. Not a cloud was to be seen the whole day and the air was perfectly clear so that we had every advantage we could desire in observing the whole of the passage of the planet Venus over the sun's disk. The data the Cook brought back to England allowed Thomas Orsby, the civilian professor of astronomy at Oxford, to derive a value of the Astronomical Union uh, in uh, this paper here of 93,726,900 English miles, which is an error of less than 1% with respect to the actual value. An absolutely brilliant measurement that they performed um, using a Gregorian telescope like the one that's shown here, uh, which they stood on barrels like the one that's shown in this reconstruction by the uh, Royal Observatory Greenwich, which they filled with wet sand to ensure stability in the scorching heat of, uh, of uh, uh, Tahitian June. And you see here at the center, the uh, observations of the transit, the planet uh, impinging onto the solar disk by the astronomer Charles Green, who tragically would not make it back to England. He would die uh, in, uh, in Jakarta in, during the second leg of the voyage. But thanks to the observations of James Cook, Charles Green and many others, uh, the AU was finally pinpointed down to 1% of its actual value. And the second rank was established at 150 million kilometers distance. By the end of the 18th century, the size of the solar system had been reliably established thanks to the measurement of the AU, the astronomical unit. Uranus, discovered in 1781, stood at an average distance of the sun of 2.8 billion kilometers. And Neptune, when it was discovered in 1846, uh, meant that that already enormous amount of empty space almost doubled to almost 5 billion kilometers, giving a really huge size for the uh, extent of the solar system. But what about the stars? because the stars had not been pinned down to a distance yet. Everybody agreed that they had to be almost unfathomably far away. But how far exactly, nobody could quite say. Now, parallax could, in principle, be used to establish their distance by exploiting the fact that our vantage point with respect to the universe changes uh, as we go around the sun. And so if we measure the position of a relatively nearby star six months apart, as we go around the sun, its apparent location uh, uh, on the background of more even more distant stars will change by a certain angle. If we can only measure this angle, the parallax will give us, uh, the formula will give us the distance. But those angles are incredibly small, even though the distance from one end to the other of our change of vantage point is a mighty 300 million uh, kilometers. Now, let's get a sense for those angles. Uh, remember the moon in the sky? Well, the moon in the sky subtends an angle of about half a degree. 
Uh, each degree is further subdivided in 60 parts, which we call minutes of arc or arc minutes. And each arc minute is further subdivided in 60 arc seconds, uh, equal parts. And the reason why we use this factor of 60, go back all the way to 5,000 years ago to Babylonian time. It's a fascinating story, but no one that we can uh, tell today. Now, the unaided human eye can discern angles as small as one arc minute, so 1 60th of a degree. Uh, this is the same angular size as one pound coin seen from 80 meters away. Now, an arc second, remember, is 60 times smaller, so this, this is the angular size of a, of a pound, pound coin seen uh, from 4.8 kilometers away. Today, we have space-based observatories that can measure tiny, tiny angles and therefore measure the distance to stars in the Milky Way very reliably. The best observatories we have can have achieved accuracy of one millionth of an arc second. This is equivalent to the angle subtended by coins on Neptune seen from the Earth. The parallax is in fact so fundamental that it led astronomers to use it to define another unit of measure for distances, the, the parsec, a word that's a contraction of the words parallax and second. So a parsec is the distance at which uh, a, a star would exhibit a parallax of one arc second. And that corresponds to 3.26 light years. And given how big a light year is, that amounts to 30,000 billion kilometers. In order to measure distance to the stars then, we needed to be able to measure tiny, tiny angles of parallax. Nobody had been able to build an instrument capable of doing that until 1838, when the mathematician and astronomer Friedrich Bessel, the director of Königsberg Observatory in today's Kaliningrad on the Russian Baltic, did it. What Bessel did was to use a heliometer, an instrument that had been originally conceived to measure the diameter of the sun, but then perfected. And an heliometer is a, is a telescope with a lens that's sliced in half, like you can see here. And the two relative halves of the lens can be adjusted horizontally by moving a, a micrometer screw. And so if you have two stars in the sky, they, and you, pass, you, you see them through a telescope with this kind of sliced lens, they would um, give you four uh, different images here. And by moving the micrometer thumb screw, you can uh, um, uh, make those uh, double images of the stars align. And uh, you, if, you, if you are able to do so by reading off by how much you've moved the relative position of the lenses with respect to each other from the micrometer and the scale up here, you can establish very, very small angle differences between the stars. So Bessel, carefully monitored the position of the star 61 uh, Cygni over the course of a year with respect to the background stars using his heliometer, finally announcing a parallax of 0 0.314 arc seconds. He pinned this star to being about three parsecs away, which meant 10 light years. A new rank had been had added to the cosmic distance ladder. One that was described by the Royal Astronomical Society President John Herschel as the greatest and most glorious triumph which practical astronomy has ever witnessed when he conferred the gold medal of the Royal Astronomical Society to Bessel in 1841. Now, 61 Cygni is not the nearest star to the Earth. Alpha Centauri and Proxima Centauri actually are. They stand at about four light years or just over a parsec away. But still, this is the new distance scale, uh, which puts stars uh, generally tens, hundreds, thousands of light years away from us. So John Herschel uh, also said that thanks to this measurement, finally, the sounding line of the distance of distances in the universe had touched bottom by measuring finally the distance to the stars. But of course, that wasn't true because further and further realms of discovery beckoned immediately afterwards. The question was merely displaced from the province of the stars, whose distances now could routinely be measured to thousands of light years away, to the mysterious realm of the nebulae. Those were those 
faint puffs of haze, sometimes showing the hint of some twirling and spiral structure that nobody could quite understand what they were. Were th those just puffs of gas nearby the Milky Way and they're, they're by quite small, or were they mighty galaxies in their own right, which were reduced to faintness merely by virtue of their great distances? Nobody could tell. And maybe if we could measure distances to us, that could give us a hint about the true nature. Now, with the turn of the 20th century, a new powerful tool came in aid to the astronomers, the photographic plate. One of the pioneers of the technique had been the amateur astronomer and medic by profession, Henry Draper, uh, who together with his wife, Mary Ann Draper, was among the first to use photographic plates to capture stars and nebulas and the spectra even of those objects. His untimely death in 1882 uh, spurred his widower wife to generously support the efforts of Harvard Observatory to continue her husband's work and map out the stars. And for several decades, she generously funded the establishment of the Henry Draper catalog that would eventually consist of over half a million photographic plates. As the observatory kept on measuring and photographing all parts of the sky, a great deal of effort was needed to look at the plates, measure the position and brightness of the ever increasing number of stars that uh, the photographic plates were revealing. And that's where the Harvard Observatory computers come in. Uh, a, uh, a, a team made exclusively of women who were entrusted the difficult and painstaking job of going through the plates, measuring position and brightness uh, of, of, of the stars. You can see some of them here, and, and the, the, the lady sat in the middle is uh, Marianne Draper herself. Uh, the most gifted and prolific of the lady astronomers uh, was undoubtedly Miss Annie Jump Cannon, who worked for 40 years at the observatory, and she personally classified over 200,000 stars. And uh, she not only classified them according to their spectrum and, their, and measured the brightness, uh, she did so uh, using uh, an instrument uh, which uh, appears quite strange, but was very, very useful, uh, the so-called fly, fly spanker. It's nothing else but a glass plate with a little handle and the glass plate you see marked in ink, uh, uh, the calibration stars. So little stars that were used as, as comparator to establish the magnitude, the brightness of the stars of interest. It was called the fly spanker because it was too small to be a, a fly swatter. Now, a contemporary of Miss Cannon was Miss Henrietta Swan Livet who had excelled in her studies at Radcliffe College, one of the few women's colleges at the time. And she was particularly gifted in mathematics, algebra and calculus, and uh, she therefore landed initially an unpaid assistantship at the Harvard Observatory in 1895. And at that point, Edward Pickering, the director of the observatory, charged her with assessing the brightness of, uh, and therefore the magnitude of stars from photographic plates. And she used the fly spanker to do the job. She later left the observatory for a stint in Europe and then in Wisconsin, and she returned in 1903 when she was uh, paid 30 cents an hour to first identify variable stars, stars whose brightness changes over time uh, in the Magellanic Clouds in the Southern Hemisphere, and then measure the changes in the brightness over time, a painstakingly difficult job. By 1908, she had amassed 777 variable stars. And she noticed a strange pattern among 16 of them in a small Magellanic cloud. In the paper she wrote in 1908, she, she stated, it is worthy of notice that the brighter variables have the longer periods. By 1912, here she is, Henrietta Leavitt, in 1921. By 1912, she had found another nine variables exhibiting the same pattern. 
The period of variability of those remarkable stars appear to reflect their brightness. You see here a, 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 a sketch of what the brightness of over time of those stars would do. It would, it would grow and then it would rapidly decline and then grow rapidly again in this characteristic pattern. We now know that those stars, which we call CFID variables, uh, uh, because of the name of the prototypical example of those stars, uh, which is a, a, a star found in the constellation of Cepheus. So those stars are actually pulsating stars. They blow up and they trap their light inside them as they blow up and then uh, their opacity drops and therefore the star contracts they release the light and uh, they dim again in a periodic fashion. Effectively, those, those stars are stars that breathe light in and out. But what Andretta Leavitt discovered was that the period of uh, pulsation, therefore the period of variation in brightness, seemed to be related to their intrinsic brightness. So by establishing 20, the existence of 25 such stars in the Magellanic Cloud, she, and because they were all at, in the same clouds, so presumably at the same distance from Earth, uh, she could uh, arguably say that their apparent brightness was a function of their period. And it wasn't, a fun, it wasn't due to, uh, to their different distance. They were all at the same distance. And when she plotted their brightness here, the log logarithm of, it, of the brightness as a function of the logarithm of the period, all the 25 stars snapped on a line. That meant that if you could measure the period of the stars by looking at this line, you would be able to work out the, in, the brightness of the stars. And from that, you could work out distance. Leavitt's law gave us a new way of measuring distances to the universe. And guided by this very law, Edwin Hubble working hundreds of nights at the 100-inch Hooker Telescope at Mount Wilson Observatory in California, started to hunt for CFID variables in nebulas. And no, no other nebula was as, as uh, prominent as the Andromeda Nebula, which we now know as the Andromeda Galaxy. In uh, this historic uh, uh, plate uh, that's preserved at the Carnegie Observatories, he uh, put down his exclamation uh, of joy when he identified with red ink in the top right, a new variable star that he later understood was precisely a CFID variable of the kind I identified by Henrietta Leavitt. And therefore, by observing the period of that star, he was able to measure the distance to the Andromeda Nebula, which we see here. Um, at this point in time, nobody knew how distant the Andromeda Nebula was. Some, including the Harvard Observatory Director, Harlow Shapley, thought that the Andromeda Nebula was just a mass of gas relatively nearby our own Milky Way, and that were, there were no other galaxies in the universe. Others uh, uh, stated that the Andromeda was actually a galaxy in itself, but deciding the matter crucially dependent on how far away the nebula was. And Hubble, by measuring this light curve, which is a characteristic um, pattern of CFID variables, exactly of the kind uh, discovered by Henrietta Leavitt, was able to put the actual distance uh, to uh, Andromeda to 1 million light years. That's half the right value that we know today, less than half, but still substantial enough to, to firmly place Andromeda outside the Milky Way and therefore put it uh, in, in, into the realm of the galaxies and, and determine its nature as a galaxy. So it was only fitting then that when Hubble sent this letter, including this diagram, to Harlow Shapley at Harvard, uh, writing, Dear Shapley, you will be interested to hear that I found a CFID variable in the Andromeda Nebula. This was in 1924. It was only fitting that when Shapley happened to open Hubble's letter, which he knew would deal a fatal blow to his theory of the Andromeda Nebula being part of our own galaxy, uh, the person who witnessed Shapley's reaction was Cecilia Payne, 
a Cambridge graduate who had taken over Miss Leavitt's old desk at the observatory as a computer uh, herself. And Miss, uh, Miss Payne later said that when Shapley saw Hubble's red Hubble's letter said, this is the letter that has destroyed my universe. Hubble's discovery then, thanks to uh, Miss Leavitt's law, added the fourth rung to a cosmic distance ladder, its top end now reaching firmly into the million of light years. This, the distance ladder started to seriously stretch far into the distance. Now, CFID variables gave us the means of measuring distances to galaxies million of light years away, but as measurements, uh, as telescopes be became bigger uh, and fainter and fainter galaxies came into view, even CFID variables became uh, unobservable. Those new galaxies were simply too far away, too distant for CFID variables to be uh, observable. And so a new, even uh, more distant rung was needed if we were to extend our ladder all the way to the end of the visible universe. Now, another thing that came into view in the 1920s is that the distance, uh, the distance between us and galaxies is, is growing due to the expansion of the universe as predicted and described by Einstein's general theory of relativity, a topic that I describe in more detail in my other Gresham lecture, Einstein's blunder. The discovery of the expansion of the universe is usually attributed to Edwin Hubble, but that's an historical mistake because in fact, the Belgian priest, Georges Lemaitre had made that discovery two years earlier in a paper that was only published in 1931 in English and therefore sort of the credit went to Hubble, but really belongs equally at least to Lemaitre and Hubble. Now, as the, as the universe expands, the light coming to us from distant galaxies is, is uniformly uh, shifted towards the red end of the spectrum, a phenomenon we call redshift. So redshift tells us how much the universe has expanded since the light left the galaxy, but says nothing about the distance that the galaxy is at that has emitted it. In fact, if we multiply redshift by the uh, speed of light, we get the velocity, and that velocity can be interpreted as the recession velocity of the galaxy, the velocity at which the galaxy is flying away from us. And as an aside, that velocity can and does exceed the speed of light for distant galaxies. That is in apparent contradiction with the special theory of relativity, but it's actually allowed under the general theory of relativity because those galaxies are not moving away from us in space. It is space itself that's stretching faster than the speed of light between us and the distant galaxies. Now, Einstein's theory of general relativity, uh, like I say, predicted this relationship. And uh, in fact, for small, relatively small distances, still measuring millions of light years, that relationship is a line. And this is the so-called discovery plot by Hubble in 1929 uh, that, that shows that indeed further galaxies appear in this plot fly away from us at a faster and faster speed than nearby ones. The slope of this line, the relationship between distant and recession velocity is today is called the hubble lemaitre constant. And it's denoted by this symbol here, H naught. And it used to be called the Hubble constant. And in, in 2018, rightly, the International Astronomical Union decided to call it hubble lemaitre constant in recognition of Georges Lemaitre fundamental contributions to cosmology early on in its history. Now we need to dwell a second on this constant because it's one of the fundamental quantities in cosmology today. Its physical interpretation is that it tells us the expansion speed of the universe today. It's expressed in funny units. It's, uh, uh, the units are kilometers per second per megaparsec, which means that if the Hubble constant, hubble lemet constant is let's say 70, kilometers per second per megaparsec, it means that for every megaparsec of distance, that's to say every 3.20, say, million light years of distance, galaxies speed away 70 kilometers per second faster. So for example, if you have a galaxy 100 million light years away, which is about 30 megaparsecs, it will be moving away from us at a speed of 2,100 kilometers per second. Now, measuring this constant is therefore one of the key endeavors of cosmology and Hubble and Lemaitre early on in the 20s and 30s had only 
sketchy data to go by, and they put the value of H0 to somewhere in the region to 500 or 600 kilometers per second to megaparsecs. As we shall see, this number has steadily gone down, but we also realized that um, the relationship between distance on this axis and recession speed or redshift on this axis is linear only near, for nearby objects, millions or hundreds of millions of light years away. Those are the first four rungs of our ladder. If you go to even further distances, this relationship begins to deviate from a straight line. And it deviates in a way that depends on the matter energy content of the universe, how much dark matter, how much cosmological constant you have in the universe. And so by measuring recession speeds and redshifts, uh, and therefore redshifts and distances for very distant objects, one can pinpoint down the cosmic recipe. And more about this is described in my Einstein's Blunder Bresham lecture. But the point is that to peer even further out in space and therefore measure distances to even greater uh, separation from us, CFID variables could not be used. They were simply too faint. We needed a, a much more powerful light beacon. And one came to us in the form of powerful explosions of, of stars at the end of the life called supernova type 1A. Here is a Hubble test space telescope picture of, of one such an explosion. You will see here the supernova exploding and then dimming away over time. This is a star that is made of carbon and oxygen, a very, a very um, compact, dense star, a white dwarf at the end of its life, um, accreting mass from a companion star and uh, the gravitational pressure increasing the temperature in the core of the star. And that creates a thermonuclear runaway reaction, which unbinds the star, makes it explode in a matter of a fraction of a second. And then the afterglow of the star powered by radioactive elements lasts for a few weeks in a very bright phase during which the, sun, the, the star can be as bright as 10 billion suns. So such bright explosions are very, very useful for us because they can be seen from very far away in very distant galaxies, and they're all uniform because of the threshold mass at which the star explodes. The light emitted by the star is not exactly identical for all of them, but can be made uniform by looking at the shape of the, um, the light curve of the star. So by using a similar trick, as Henrietta Leavitt's law, Leavitt's law, we can not only standardize the supernovae, make them all look equal to each other, but also tell how much uh, distance there is between us and them, simply by the fact that if they all emit the same amount of light intrinsically, the amount of light that we receive and observe must be diluted by distance. And therefore, we can work out the distance to very far away objects in the universe. And that has been done over the past 20 or 30 years. And you can see the distance ladder, this, the relationship between velocity or redshift and distance to uh, extra galactic objects, to distant galaxy, has been increased mightily in distance. Uh, look at the hundreds of megaparsecs in the x-axis. And the original Hubble range of uh, observations is the tiny little uh, red square in the bottom left. So the distance ladder, thanks to the supernova type 1A, has been added, has been increased to achieve a new rung, a rung that now firmly puts the top end of the ladder to 2 billion light years. So really a big ladder reaching very, very far into the universe. In December 2021, the SHOES program reported their new results. This program had been uh, going on for over 15 years using a thousand orbit of the Hubble Space Telescope in order to observe the three distance, distance ladder ranks in sequence and it, with overlapping distance indicators. So they spent a great deal of effort in improving the distance ladder by uh, looking at parallax measurements and then CFID variables and then supernova explosions of the kind that we just saw and uh, making sure that at each rung of the ladder, they would have at least two distance indicators in order to make sure that no errors and offsets would be introduced between one rung and the other. 
They also used the Hubble Space Telescope because of its unique stability and unique capability of seeing clearly and measuring uh, brightness very, very precisely from orbit where conditions are stable and uh, do not change over time. Furthermore, the Hubble can also see in near infrared light, a type of light with longer wavelength than visible light, which is less subject to absorption by uh, interstellar and intergalactic dust. And therefore, those observations give a, a, a more precise and accurate measurement of the brightness of objects. The final results are summarized in these three boxes here. Each one of them shows one rung of the ladder from the bottom left, parallax, to the middle one, CFITS uh, variables, and the top right, the supernovae stellar explosions. And you can see they all line up beautifully. And from this very precise data, they could derive a value for the Hubble constant, which comes out to 73.04 kilometers per second per megaparsec with a margin of uncertainty of only one kilometers per second per megaparsec. So a very, very highly precise measurement of the value of the Hubble limit constant. And that is wonderful, except while the astronomers were busy, busy building and improving their distance ladder from the ground up, cosmologists such as myself were actually doing it in the other way, uh, building a, a distance ladder from the opposite end of the universe by observing the leftover light, the leftover radiation from the Big Bang itself the relic radiation that is the afterglow of the Big Bang here in this diagram, which was emitted uh, uh, when the universe was a mere 380,000 years old, and that has been traveling through the cosmos ever since until it ends up in our telescopes and observatories 13.8 billion years later. This map shows a snapshot of the baby universe and the distribution of that cosmic light as it was 380 years, 1,000 years after the Big Bang. And as I discuss in, in, uh, in uh, my dark universe and, and my way in the universe, Gresham lectures, a great deal of information can be extracted from this leftover light from the Big Bang. In particular, uh, the value of the Hubble Lemaitre constant, while not measured directly by the relic radiation, is important because dialing the value of H0 puts this data in and out of focus as well. So by choosing a specific value for the Hubble uh, Lumet constant, the data from the relic radiation snap into focus. And that is an indirect met method of measuring the uh, value of H0. So the cosmologist had another mean, a very distant mean, in fact, of measuring the current expansion of the universe and uh, the hope was, and the expectation certainly was, that the two ladders, the one built from shoes, the shoes program from the ground up, and the other coming all the way from the end of the visible universe, from the Rayleigh radiation, coming dangling down, as it were, from the end of the universe, that the two ladders would meet and give us the same value of the hubble lemaitre constant. But the fact is, they don't. And you can see that the relic light measurement of the Hubble Lemaitre constant uh, gave a lower value of 67.4 kilometers per, megapar per second per megaparsec compared to the 73 value uh, given by shoes. Now, you might think, well, what's the big deal? It's a 10% difference. What's a few kilometers per second per megaparsec between friends? Well, that's true, but the margin of error is important. The margin of error is now only one kilometer per second per megaparsec, uh, according to the SHOES program. And uh, this margin of error has been really very precisely established. And the way those margins of error uh, uh, work is that a margin of one kilometer per second per megaparsec means that the, there is a probability of about 68% that the true value of H0 is between 72 and 74 there is a probability of about 95% that it is uh, between 71 and 75 and so on. And actually there is a probability of less than one in a million that the true value of the hubble lemaitre constant is between five times the error, which uh, is um, a range between 68 and 78. 
And therefore, the fact that the margin of error is so tight means that the value measured by the Rayleigh gradation of 67 is uh, really, really improbable. It's really, really improbable that the two measurements are both correct and they differ only by random noise, by measurement uncertainty. Something is up in the universe. The fact that these two measurements uh, with very tight errors, nevertheless, are far away from each other in terms of the margin of error, means that there is something we don't understand in the distance scale. What could it be? There are three possible solutions to this conundrum. One, the shoe's distance ladder is somehow in error. Now, that's possible because it's made up many different measurements from geometry and parallax, CFID variables, supernovae explosions, and all of, all of them are very difficult to make, and they rely on certain assumptions, rely on, on the physics of the objects. Some observational error could have crept in somehow. But the SHOES team has been incredibly careful in trying different variants of the analysis, in making sure they have checked for all possible errors in their distance rank measurements. It's really, really difficult to see how their analysis could be improved. What about the distant end of the ladder? Maybe that is an error, but that's possible too. But uh, really, the relic radiation uh, from the early universe is very well understood, and it's an exceedingly good agreement with many, many predictions of general relativity. We think we really understand the baby universe almost better, in fact, than we understand the present day universe. So it's really hard to see how this 67 kilometers per second per megaparsec measurement could be in error. And so if both measurements are right, then the third option is that our model for the universe might be wrong or at least missing a piece. It could be, for example, that in the early universe, right after the Big Bang, something else is going on. Some new physics is at work that makes it so that the data that we receive from the relic uh, light from the Big Bang are somehow in a different focus. And therefore, they lead to uh, the wrong value of H0, simply because we're missing a piece of physics that goes on very early on after the Big Bang and uh, we don't know about. So it could well be that this discrepancy is pointing at some fundamental new component in the makeup of the universe and our understanding of the physics uh, right after the Big Bang we simply don't know. Many, many theoretical explanations have been put forward by the community. None of them so far uh, is clearly in the lead. And so I think that this resolution of this big conundrum, the um, bringing together of the two distance ladders will have to await, unless we find a mistake in the current measurements, we'll have to await new independent measurements of H0 that do not rely on the distance ladder as we've known it so far, that do not rely on the relic radiation. If we do get a third measurement, for example, using gravitational waves, uh, then that could be a, the way to establish which one of the two, 67 or 73, is the right. And that could give us a hint as to what the universe is up to. It is, it is a fascinating mystery and one that will keep cosmologists and astronomers busy for the next few years. And finally, we hope to be able one day to extend our cosmic distance ladder uninterrupted all the way to the end of the visible universe. Thank you. <laughs>